My friends in Christ, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, having so many high school graduations this weekend, uh, I've been doing some thinking on my, my own high school career, uh, and it's a uh, 20 year reunion is coming up next summer, hard to believe. But when I was a high school senior, I took advanced placement English from Mrs. Wolford at Bellevue West High School. And Mrs. Wolford was one of the best teachers I ever had all throughout school. She had a way of opening up literature that helped us better understand the world around us. And she pushed and she prodded us to become the best writers that we could be as well. And throughout the year, we learned all about the various literary devices. We learned about the major literary themes that you'd find from work to work of literature throughout history and across cultures. We learned about symbolism and how all of that fit together and how to recognize it and, and uh, what, what it all meant. And uh, you name it, we covered it in detail. And she gave us all of these tools in our, in our toolboxes to be able to unpack and understand what we read. And by the end of the year, when we had this box of tools at our disposal, an assignment from her would consist of reading a poem or a short passage of prose, and with the simple instructions, explicate and analyze. And that was the entire assignment, and we would, we would be expected to spend the entire hour explicating and analyzing what it was that she gave us. That was it. We were supposed to closely read and analyze whatever the assigned passage had been and discern both its meaning and its relevance. But today I want to do something kind of similar to that with one sentence from our second reading. Uh, if you want to look along in your pew Bibles, uh, you can look at uh, the top of page 985. Uh, it's from 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 15 and 16. It's at the top of page 985. And this is one of those weird verses. Usually, uh, it, when, when they divided up verses in the Bible, it's usually sentence by sentence, sort of. But this is one of those that it's one sentence, but it kind of covers. It's the second half of verse 15 and the first half of verse 16. But it reads, Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is within you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. This single, simple sentence from 1 Peter really gets at the heart of our calling to be bearers of the good news of God in Christ to the world and deserves our attention, especially in a world that increasingly is convinced that the church has very little to say to it anymore. So, in honor of Mrs. Wolfer, Let's explicate and analyze. First, it begins with always be ready. Always be ready. Think for a moment. If someone were to walk up to you and say, I noticed you went to church this morning. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And what difference does that make in the world? What would your answer be? What do we believe? Well, we, we have these creeds that we say most weeks in church. Now, creed is simply a statement of belief. The Apostles' Creed begins, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and so on and so forth. And that's a good start. But what do we mean exactly when we say those things, when we recite those words? Are they just words, or have we spent time studying them, wrestling with them, thinking about what they say and what we mean when we recite them? Well, that was a concern that Martin Luther shared, and that's why he wrote a small catechism, which has short, clear explanations of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Sacraments of Baptism and Holy Communion. His idea behind writing it actually was not so that confirmation students would study it in church, but to provide parents a way to help their children learn about their faith at home. It was a tool for families to study their faith together. 
And what would happen if families looked at the small catechism together and asked themselves together, what does this mean? One exercise that I've seen suggested and that I've seen done sometimes in confirmation programs is to write your own creed. What is important to you about your faith? How would you articulate that? The second part of always being ready is to consider the question, why do I believe what I believe? And this is just as important in, in many ways as what we actually do believe. Now, is this something that I've read in the Bible? Is this something that society tells me? Is this something that I've learned through experience? Was it some combination of factors? How did I come to these conclusions? How did I come to believe these things? Now, as Lutherans, while we value personal experience and we value traditions, ultimately it is the Word of God that is our basis for our belief. We also believe, though, that the Word of God, first and foremost, is the living Word, Jesus Christ. Now, you remember the beginning of the Gospel according to John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus himself is the living Word that speaks to us in our situations today. And so when we approach the Bible, when we approach the written Word, we do so through Jesus-colored and cross-shaped glasses. We filter, we interpret what we read through the lens of Christ crucified and risen. And so it is with, in, in our confrontation with the living word in Jesus, through the written word of the Bible, that we wrestle with why we believe what we believe. Hold on a second. This sounds like work. It is. But if we're going to address the third part of always being ready, our faith making a difference in the world, then we need to personally spend time wrestling in the messiness of those first two questions. Only when we have an idea of what we believe and why we believe it can it make any difference in the world, either in our lives or anyone else's. And this isn't just navel-gazing that we're doing. The, uh, the, word, the, the third part of, of the Word of God that, that we believe, we believe Jesus is the living Word, we believe the Bible is the written Word, and we believe in the proclaimed Word of God. And that comes through preaching, that comes through conversation and discussion and being part of the body of Christ. This is not just a, a singular thing that we are doing, but it is something that we do as a community. Wrestling with our faith in this kind of way is a messy process. Then again, isn't life messy? Now, isn't the world messy? And how can faith even begin to speak to our lives outside the walls of the church if we haven't engaged it? So this third part is the so what. So we believe certain things about God, and so we have an idea of why we believe those things, but now what? What difference does that make? Is it a matter of just factual head knowledge that we can file away in our church compartment and then go on living real life somewhere else? Or does it matter? It doesn't matter in our day-to-day -day life that God created the world and all that is in it. How does that color how we see creation? How does that color how we see others, even those that we disagree with or who may hate us? How does it matter that Jesus was fully divine and fully human, and that he died on the cross and rose again? How does it matter that, that the Holy Spirit is alive and active uh, and at work in the world today? All of Jesus' teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, all of what Paul and others wrote in the New Testament on our Christian life and our relationships with each other and with God, how do all of these things relate with each other and make a difference in how we see and act in the world? Now this is where we move from believing things about God to believing in God. Putting our trust in God and allowing that trust to transform us. 
Notice how uh, the writer describes that w what it is that we are giving an accounting for. Is it dogma? Is it theology? No, we are giving an accounting of our hope. The hope that is within us. All of this study, all of this introspection, all of this communication and, and, and discussion that, that comes in the body of Christ, all of this that we do leads to a forming of our personal theology. Now, that, that can sound kind of hoity-toity in our head in, in the clouds, but theology just comes from two simple Greek words, theos and logos. Theos is simply God, and logos is word. So when we talk about theology, this is God words. Words about God. What is it that we say about God? Now, and so we come up with some words about God, but those words are not there simply for their own sake. They're not just intellectual exercises. Our theology, our God words, point to hope. The writer of 1 Peter understands that we are Christians because of the hope that is within us. The hope that comes from the cross and from the empty tomb and the resurrection. The gospel, the good news, the message of Christ is one of hope. God created the world. God loves the world so much that Jesus lived, died, and rose so that sin and death might be defeated and all of creation might be reconciled to God. We live in a now but not yet world where we still experience pain and death and the consequence of sin and our brokenness. But we also live in the promise of the hope of the new Jerusalem. God, even now, is making all things new in every act of mercy and justice and mission that we undertake as a foretaste of that feast yet to come in that final time. Every time we gather around the communion table, we both remember back to Christ's death and resurrection. And at the same time, we anticipate that great feast at the end of time when death and pain and tears will be no more. Our God words are words of hope. And our call is to share that hope with the world around us through what we say and through what we do. How then do we do this? First of all, the writer of 1 Peter reminds us that it's with gentleness. Now, the root of the Greek word here is the same one that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.5 5, when he says, Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. This, the same word that's, uh, that's translated as, as meek is, has the same root as the one that we see translated as gentleness here. Now we associate meekness today with allowing ourselves to be a doormat for whatever anyone else wants to say or do, but what the Greek is really getting at is more of a sense of gentleness of spirit. That, that trying to understand the other, that, that, that peace, uh, bringing, bringing peace and, and wholeness and, and fulfillment. How often over time has the Bible or the gospel message itself been used as a weapon to assert power or authority instead of being used to convey the message of hope in Christ? How does this happen? Well, I think we sometimes forget the double meaning of hope. First, hope is something we want to have happen. We want to remember hope is a good thing. And the message of hope that we find in the cross is the message that even when there is nothing we ourselves do to climb up the ladder to God, God came down to us. And God still comes to us. I'm sure many of us have, have seen the diagram uh, showing two cliffs, you know, us on one side and God on the other side, with this giant chasm in between representing our sin, you know, separating us from God. And, and then a cross is drawn in the middle that, uh, that, that bridges that gap between us and our sinfulness and God. Now that, that diagram is a little incomplete because even when the cross is drawn in the middle, we are still powerless to walk across that chasm to God. The cross is not our pathway to God. The cross 
is God's pathway to us. This is good news for the whole world. So then why doesn't the world hear it as the good news that it is? It's because often we tie up our, our gift of hope with strings of condemnation and fear. We turn the God who has invited all of us to the party instead into the heavenly bouncer trying to keep out the undesirables. Now the other aspect of hope that we often, that we often confuse is that we, we confuse hope with knowledge. Now, we can be confident in our hope in Christ. We can have a confident faith, and indeed the church is at its best when it's active in ministry throughout the world, compelled by that confident faith and hope. But faith, hope, by their very definitions, are things we can't prove. We can become so sure of ourselves, so sure that we believe the right things that our interpretation of the Bible and of who God is, is the right and only way to see it. And then we lose the humility that naturally comes with faith. We replace faith and trust with misplaced knowledge and misplaced trust in ourselves. One of my favorite sayings is that the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty or knowledge. When we confuse ourselves is when mission and the good news both to each other and to the outside world is sacrificed on the altar of being right. That's not to say that what we believe isn't important. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent the first half of what I've been saying talking about uh, what we believe. But we must always, always deliver our message of hope with the gentleness and the humility that comes through faith. Now finally, the good news is a message that we speak with reverence. We think that God's message of hope is so important. It is so holy. It is such good news for the world that we do everything in our power not to allow our words and actions to get in the way of that message. If we preach forgiveness, but we harbor grudges in our hearts, we are not treating our message with reverence. If we preach grace, but then place strings on others, we are not treating God's message with reverence. If we preach Jesus and the cross, but then we live as though there were no empty Easter tomb, then why should the world listen to anything we have to say? The way we go about loving either fully or with strings attached, disagreeing with, it, uh, with one another either with respect or with contempt, speaks volumes about what we really think about those things that we say are important to us. The gospel is the most important message that anyone will ever hear, whether it's spoken or seen. How many people out there don't follow Christ because of experiences that they've had with the church? Or because the message that they've heard and seen proclaimed has not been the gospel of hope? Reverence here simply means respecting the gospel so much that we try as hard as we can not to obscure it for others with our own sinfulness. When I took the high school kids to San Francisco last summer, one of the uh, youth works uh, workers that, that uh, helped us during the week put it this way, our calling is to point to the cross and duck. Point to the cross get out of the way. Always be ready to make our defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. It is that hope that gives us our calling as disciples. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds.